Now available in paperback and Kindle Unlimited, Isis, Escape from Transylvania. The goddess next door and John Haynes must escape a horde of vampires on the hunt in this horror-filled Isis series adventure. Get Isis, Escape from Transylvania in paperback and Kindle Unlimited today. One of my viewers asked me to talk about what was wrong with Avengers Infinity War after seeing my review video that I posted last week. And as a screenwriter, I'm going to go in-depth talking about what was wrong with this screenplay. Because when I take a look at this Avengers Infinity War and what was presented on screen, I clearly see a screenplay that is just as bad as the ones Tyler Perry used to write when he made his Medea movies. And when I take a look at this screenplay, the opening scene was one of the worst opening scenes I have ever seen in a Marvel Studios movie. And this opening scene literally was the first fumbled football of this film. Now, when you take a look at this Avengers Infinity War and you look at that opening scene on Fade In, it does not provide the viewer with an entry point into the film. No, when you take a look at Avengers Infinity War's opening scene on Fade In, we have these two ships out here, and we have us being told that the Asgardian ship is in distress, and that really stops the film from having an impact on the viewer. When it comes down to film, we need to see things happen. Now, if someone who saw Thor Ragnarok saw things, they saw this ship getting blown up. But if I'm a new viewer, I don't know what's going on. And what we needed to see in Avengers Infinity War was we needed to see that ship with the Asgardians on it being followed and fired on, just like we saw in Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope when we saw Princess Leia's ship being attacked by this huge Imperial um, battleship. And once that ship was subdued, we saw the ship being um, captured and then after that we faded in on the interiors where we saw these uh, rebels and then we saw the stormtroopers which had a nice contrast because they were battle armored and ready versus the rebels who were just wearing cloth uniforms and then after watching all of these rebels being slaughtered by the stormtroopers we got the grand entrance of Darth Vader and when we got that grand entrance of Darth Vader it resonated because we saw this guy as someone we needed to take seriously, and we saw him as a threat. And what happened with Avengers Infinity War was Thanos' threat was neutralized because the Russos and the screenwriters just didn't fade in on the right shot. And because they didn't fade in on this Asgardian ship being taken down by Thanos' ship, and then Thanos going in and just beating up Asgardian gods and then making that grand entrance to show how powerful he was, he lost all of the ability to have that impact on screen. And the reason why he didn't have that impact on screen is because the screenwriters did not write the scene the way it should have been. If this character was built up over 20 movies and 10 years, he deserved to have a grand entrance on the same level of Darth Vader in Star Wars A New Hope. But what we got in the opening scene was an opening scene for those who were Marvel Cinematic Universe fans, but not new viewers. And us seeing Thanos and all these gods laid out, and then Thanos choking out Thor, that was telling instead of showing. That really did not have an impact, and what made it worse was the Russos using a wide shot. When they used the wide shot, it sucked all the impact out of the scene. Because instead of having a strong establishing shot where we clearly saw the characters, we had a very cluttered scene that really did not give us that type of impact that scene could have had. If you look at A New Hope, it's very clear from the white, stark white pictures and then Vader's black uniform, what impact that had. And when I looked at that Avengers Infinity War, the screenwriters and everybody together really did not do a good job of opening the movie up with a strong opening scene. And again, the screenplay really told 
instead of showed. And I saw that later on when they had Thanos talking about the power gem. And he's talking about this power gem making him the most powerful person in the universe. And that was really telegraphing as I saw it. I mean, if you really wanted to really have an impact, you really wouldn't just tell me that the power gem makes him powerful. You would have the Hulk attack him, and then you would have Thanos saying, I thought you were the strongest one there was, and then he beats him up. And that would actually f lead into Bruce Banner's psychological issues. But because the screenplay told instead of showed where Thanos has the power gem and then mocks Bruce Banner, we really don't get a clear understanding of why Bruce Banner has the psychological issues. Because many comic fans know Hulk likes to say Hulk is the strongest one there is. And this would have been a way to lead into it for the second movie, which is what I believe they want to do. But because they did not execute well by having Thanos use a little psychology and leaving some emotional resonance, that was what led to the scene where the Hulk gets beat up, really being an incredibly weak scene, because that would have that would have really had some impact if we had seen, you know, the opening scene being the ship being taken down by Thanos' ship, Thanos talking about he's going to go get or retrieve this gem, and instead of him having the Black Order helping him out, he's doing it by himself. He makes this grand entrance, he's beating up Asgardian gods, and then after he's beaten up Thor and has left him laid out, you have Loki talking about, we have a Hulk, and then the Hulk attacking him, and then Thanos looking at him and saying, I thought you were the strongest one there was, and then he just beats him up, and that would have had more emotional impact, more emotional resonance, and it would have led to a bit tighter and more cohesive story. And it would have led to people having a little bit more of a reason to see some fear in a guy like Loki and him actually giving him the space gem and then the other, and then giving him the space gem later on in the story. And that would have had more of an impact, but the writers, you know, they didn't really do a good job on the script because they, it looks like a second draft to me. And the reason why I look, say it's a second draft is because I look at this film and I see no emotional resonance. And I look at those opening scenes, and they could have had that emotional resonance had they executed the way I had talked about in just a couple of minutes ago, where they built things up. But because they don't build things up, there's no emotional resonance because many of the characters in this story, they're really two-dimensional and they're paper thin. They really don't really make you feel anything like you would feel like when you were watching a movie like Terminator 2 Judgment Day where we had all of these rich multi-dimensional characters and because there were such rich multi-dimensional characters in Terminator 2 we felt everything from when the T-800 arrives to the relentlessness of the T-1000 to Sarah Connor's love for her son to John Connor's love for the mother and the T-800 because we have these characters who are rich and multidimensional. And one of the problems with Avengers Infinity War is that they try to cram so many characters into the story that we don't really get to know someone. And because we don't get to know anyone, we really don't get to care about what happens on screen in Avengers Infinity War. I was very indifferent about Avengers Infinity War, this movie that was supposed to be built up to be the grand climax of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And the reason why I was indifferent to the movie is because this movie really had nothing in it to really resonate with the viewer as related to emotion. When you look at a movie like Star Wars, A New Hope, or you look at Terminator 2 Judgment Day, there are things in that movie that make you feel something. And many of the scenes make you feel tension. Many of the scenes make you feel on the edge of your seat because the action is so intense. When you look at Avengers Infinity War, it's it's a film, because of the screenplay, you really don't feel anything because everything just feels so telegraphed and so, you know, put together. It just doesn't really make you feel anything on on the screen. It just makes you feel like it's just there. 
And one of the other problems with, with Avengers Infinity War is a lot of the dialogue. A lot of the dialogue in Avengers Infinity War is just, again, it comes across as a second draft. And I remember looking at several scenes with Black Widow and Scarlet Witch, and I could easily see that the dialogue was interchangeable. And I looked at some of the scenes in Avengers Infinity War, and the dialogue really, it doesn't do a good job of establishing characters or really moving the story forward. And I really think that this film had some of the worst dialogue I have ever really seen in a Marvel Cinematic Universe movie. And I look at several of the scenes and I really see scenes that really needed to be read aloud because some of the scenes like with Star-Lord and Guardians of the Galaxy, they went way too long. And when it comes down to the jokes, the jokes really just, they really just needed to be gone from this movie. If this is supposed to be a universal crisis, then we needed a completely different tone than what was presented in Avengers Infinity War. And I thought that there was just too much banter, too much jokes. When you have a universe crisis movie, I want to see something with more of a serious tone, like I saw in Terminator 2, or even in a movie like Independence Day. Now, Independence Day is an absolutely crappy movie. But at least Roland Emmerich knew that he needed a serious tone in order for the viewer to feel the emotional impact of what was going on. I mean, if this is a universe crisis, we needed to see a universe level level of seriousness. Now, when I was writing The Man Who Rules the World, and I had this Earth level crisis with men and gods and demons, I also wanted to make sure there was a serious tone to the story because if this is something that's going to be world ending and world shattering, I don't want to see people bantering back and forth and I don't want to see a whole bunch of jokes going on when there's something of this magnitude going on. It's just like watching some major event going on where there's bombings going on and then it's on the news and you see people just sitting there telling jokes and going back and forth. It doesn't really help the story, and it makes you not take what goes on in the story seriously. Now, another problem I had with Avengers Infinity War as a screenplay is how shallow this story really is. I mean, when you take a look at Avengers Infinity War from a screenwriter's perspective, the story really is one of the most shallow stories I have ever seen in the whole science fiction genre. When it comes down to Avengers Infinity War, stuff just happens. Thanos beats up people. He gets these Infinity Gems. But we really don't get any depth. We really don't get any layers. And we really don't get any substance. There's a lot of flash going on for two and a half hours. But there's none of the great elements of a great film. I mean, there's no irony, there's no symbolism, there's no foreshadowing, or any of the elements in great storytelling. And that's one of the reasons why I called it a big-budget Star Trek The Next Generation season finale, part one. And it's even worse than a Star Trek The Next Generation season finale, and it doesn't have any of the substance of a Star Trek The Next Generation season finale. It, it just doesn't have any of those things that great science fiction or great fantasy has. Because great science fiction and great fantasy, like the Twilight Zone, the Star Wars trilogy, the Terminator movies, old school Star Trek, they all make a social commentary on the world around us. And when I look at Avengers Infinity War, it's a very, very shallow movie. It's a very surface movie. And it adapts the letter of the material, but it doesn't have any heart or any soul like the original Star Wars trilogy, old school Star Trek, The Twilight Zone, or Terminator 2 Judgment Day, or the Terminator first Terminator movie. And because those movies made social commentaries about the world around them, they resonated with people. And because those movies had depth and layers, they allowed us to really think about the world around us. And one of the movies that used to really make me think about the world around me was 1987's RoboCop. Now, RoboCop was one of those movies most people didn't think of much about, 
but it really told a very powerful story about uh, corporate greed, and it told a great story about consumerism and the human condition. And it's a movie that has stayed with me for over 30 years, because as I saw this Alex Murphy lose his life and then reclaim his humanity, it was one of those stories that really resonated with me, because it was a story about a man trying to rediscover his humanity after this corporation had turned him into this product. And that's what made that movie extremely brilliant. But I didn't see any sorts of flashes of that type of brilliance in Avengers Infinity War. Yes, there's a whole bunch of great special effects in this movie, which is very flashy, but none of the substance of a great science fiction movie or a great fantasy movie. Now, my other issue with this movie, as related to the story, is, again, they did not build the villain into the credible threat he was hyped up to be. Now, over the course of 20 movies, we were told that this Thanos was supposed to be the most dangerous villain in the movie. That's what they set up. Unfortunately, we didn't get much payoff due to that horrible opening scene that did not give Thanos grand entrance that he deserved and was supposed to be built up to, excuse me. Now, when we take a look in contrast to Darth Vader, Darth Vader got his grand entrance. And because he got that grand entrance, it laid the foundation for him being established as this credible threat. And because he was choking out people on that ship, we saw him as somebody dangerous. And when he confronted Princess Leia, it showed us how much of a threat he was. And later on, when they were having scenes in the Death Star and he was choking out the Admiral, we saw how serious this Darth Vader was. Unfortunately, Thanos was prevented from being uh, the threat he was supposed to be due to the writers going out here and then bringing in this black guard to do his dirty work for him. And those henchmen, they were just a plot device in order to get Tony Stark and Doctor Strange on that, and Spider-Man on that ship, and they were a plot device to move the story forward, but they watered down the threat of the Thanos character that was supposed to have been built up over the years, and it took away from a lot of what could have been great emotional resonance in the story, and showed why this character was a legit threat to the universe. Now, in contrast, we have the T-1000, who was from Terminator 2, and he was established as a legitimate threat from minute one. When we saw the T-1000 come on the screen, the first person he kills is a police officer. And then he assumes the police officer's identity. And that was done for a reason. And James Cameron did that for a reason because he wanted to show how this police officer was somebody that we all trusted. And because he gained everyone's trust, he was able to run roughshod throughout Los Angeles. Whereas in contrast, we had Arnold Schwarzenegger's T-800, who was a biker, and that was there for a reason as well, because as the, many people know, the biker is considered the outlaw, and they consider when civilization falls, the outlaw will be the only law. So I understood the contrast between those two characters, and I saw why the T-1000 was a, a legitimate threat, because they built him up very slowly, and they built him up as a, as a credible threat because of the uniform he wore and the way he behaved. And the way he was, and the reason why he was in that police officer's uniform is because they wanted to say that the police officer is programmed to do things a certain way, and they are programmed to take action a certain way. And most people don't see it as a threat, but it is a threat. And I look at this Avengers Infinity War. And the story, it just has so many bad problems with it. And one of the biggest problems I had with this story was all the convenient and coincidental occurrences. And as Thanos gets the gems, it's not done in an organic fashion. Instead, we get these sequences where he gets the gems by bullying heroes. And that's some Tyler Perry-level bad writing. Uh, now, I look at that opening scene where... Thanos got the gem by bullying Loki for Thor's life, and that was a really cringe-worthy scene, because you look at that scene, and you don't see him being a threat, because they didn't really build him up to be a threat. It's like, Loki just tries to give it to him, 
in the hopes that he can get to him later on. But the whole scene just does it just falls apart because the writing just it just makes a convenient plot hole for him. And another plot hole they made for him was with the reality scene. And the reality scene is one of the worst scenes in the movie. The scene where Thanos gets the reality gem, that's a scene that really robs the viewer because we don't see him take the gem. We don't see him take this reality gem. We just get shown him distorting reality. And that really cheats the viewer as I see it because if this is supposed to be a super bad, we needed to see him have this confrontation with the Collector, and we needed to see him take this gem. And then when he confronts Star-Lord, that will give that scene some more emotional impact because they will realize they, they came too late, but the way they executed the scene really just took away from that and did not give us the emotional impact. Instead, we got another plot device for Thanos to take Gamora away from Star-Lord, and that's why that scene is one of the weakest scenes in the movie. Now, the scene with the time gem on Titan, that's another scene that just, it's just awkward and really forced. And the whole thing where Tony Stark gets stabbed, that's a really, that's a facepalm-worthy scene. And I look at that scene, it's another really bad scene because we have Thanos talking about how he knows Tony Stark's name and he knows who Tony Stark is even though he's never seen Tony Stark in his life. And again, this is another scene that was designed for comic fans, but it was not designed for casual viewers of the movie. And I looked at that scene, and again, that's some more Tyler Perry-level bad writing. Now, they wanted to make a little bit of a plot twist with that scene, but what they did was they just showed how bad of a writer that these screenwriters were, because... When Tony Stark got stabbed and he calls him Tony, it, it just doesn't make any sense because there's nothing to build that up. And there was nothing in the story to build it up. And those that sequence, just it just was one of the worst scenes in the movie next to the one where I saw this whole plot convenience where Rocket Raccoon conveniently has an eye in his pocket to help Thor replace the eye he had in Thor Ragnarok. And that eye was not there organically. It just conveniently just pops up out of nowhere, and it's just another sign of really terrible writing as related to the screenplay, where we get all these conveniences and convenient occurrences, but nothing that happens through an organic fashion that allows us to really un see the story coming together in a, where there's a flow and a reason for things happening. And one of the things that made me see it as completely illogical of Rocket Raccoon giving Thor the eye is when Thor goes to the, start the forge over, and this forge has the power of a neutron star, but the new eye in Thor's head never has any problems. And that, again, has, is another plot hole that was in the screenplay due to the bad writing. And another occurrence that really annoyed me was the whole thing with Thor's new hammer. Now, after the pieces come out of the forge, we have Groot conveniently there to give this hammer a brand new handle. And again, this is another telegraph sequence that is the hallmark of bad screenwriting. And these, this screenplay is just one of the worst ones I have ever seen in a while. I mean, I thought the Batman and Robin script was bad, but this one is almost on the same level of bad writing when I look at many of the conveniences and many of the occurrences in this movie, like the final fight between the, all the heroes and Thanos on Titan, and then Star-Lord getting emotional, that was another terrible scene that just, again, desperately needed a rewrite, because that scene was absolutely just horrible screenwriting. I mean, it needed to be a bit more organic, just like the whole thing was related to the transitions as related to the reality scene where we just got them guardians showing up and then Thanos manipulating reality. No, we needed to see the collector getting beat up and then the guardians coming too late and that would have allowed that sequence with Gamora to have a little bit more emotional impact and emotional resonance. Now, there are some other plot points I had some issues with with this Avengers Infinity War. And again, the original, the one with Thanos calling to Iron Man Tony was ridiculous, as I saw it, since he never saw him. And 
the all other scene with Tony Stark creating the nano armor and then putting the arc reactor back in his chest, that's a sequence, another one I had a real issue with. Because that whole sequence that opens the movie contradicts all of Iron Man 2 and Iron Man 3. Because the whole point of Iron Man 2 was to get Tony to a point where he could feel like he could live again. And the whole point of Iron Man 3 was to show t that Tony didn't need the armor and that it was him and that he was Iron Man. And that was the reason why he threw the second arc reactor into the sea to show that he didn't need the armor to be a crutch to carry him through life. And when you see Iron Man in the nano armor with the arc reactor on his chest again, it destroys all of the character development of Iron Man 2 and 3. Just like Rocket Raccoon giving Thor that new eye destroyed all of the reasons for Thor Ragnarok and all the character development of Thor Ragnarok. Because when we look at that movie, you know, the Thor character was presented as he didn't need his hammer, but in this movie, he needs his hammer. So, what was the purpose of us having Iron Man 2 and 3 and Thor Ragnarok if you're going to go out here and retcon all of that story just to have this story? And then we have the Vision talking about how he has Ultron in him. Now, I saw a hint of that in Avengers Age of Ultron, but that revelation really made no sense So many, since many people thought that the Vision destroyed Ultron in Avengers Age of Ultron. So they're saying that he has Jarvis, Ultron, and the Mind Stone, but all of that really, it just never really came together. It just seemed like an expository plot point that really went nowhere. Now, everything in this screenplay is supposed to build towards this Wakanda climax, and the Wakanda climax is, as I see it, the worst sequence in all of Infinity War, next to Star-Lord's emotionalism in the final ba in the battle with Thanos. Now, this is a clumsy, awkward, and uneven sequence, and it proves my point about Marvel Studios just not being able to write a third act. And writing third acts is something that Marvel Studios has a serious problem with. They know how to open some of their movies, they know how to have a good second act, but they just can't make the whole movie pay off with a big finish. And this is a big problem that has been throughout numerous Marvel Studios movies from Iron Man 2 on, and when it's just gotten worse over time. And Avengers Infinity War has the worst third act out of all the Marvel Studios movies. It's clunky, it's awkward, it's uneven, it's choppy, and it just it just doesn't really work. I mean, the aliens going through the barrier were conveniently added so Black Panther could let down the barrier. The war wheels stolen straight out of Justice League Savage Time were just there to kill Proxima Midnight. And then there was the whole thing with Captain America and Black Panther taking punches from Thanos. Now, here's a guy who was established in the opening scenes with the Power Gem as capable of beating down the Hulk, but Captain America and Black Panther, who are less powerful than he is, get punched by him and get knocked down. No broken bones, no internal injuries, nothing. So, And that makes no logical sense, because when I think about it, here's a guy, again, who beat the crap out of the Hulk, who is twice as dense, or four or five times as dense, but Black Panther, even if he's wearing armor, is still going to feel that impact from that, from that, power of Thanos, and he should have, that suit of his should have been blown up from that punch, because if his suit absorbs impact, there should have been so much impact, his suit should have exploded. And when it came down to Captain America, he should have just been dead from that punch. But in this story, even if it's comic books, it just doesn't make any logical sense. I know it's a comic book movie, but again, there has to be an internal frame of logic. When I look at this frame of logic in this movie, it's just inconsistent. I mean, when I was writing the first Isis and East Team Ascension, I had it where Isis and East Team were facing super-powered um, demons. And in both stories, these are people with no powers, and they were getting beat up by these demons who had super strength, and they were getting broken bones and internal injuries. And that's all part of making sure that the story remains consistent. And Infinity War didn't have that type of consistency 
as related to the screenwriting. And when I look at this screenplay, it's just, it's a very sloppy screenplay, it's a very poorly written screenplay, and it's a very uneven screenplay. And that's why I believe that this screenplay desperately needed a third or fourth rewrite to get some things consistent. That opening scene, as I see it, should have been rewritten completely as a way to establish the Thanos character and to really put some psychological resonance on that fight with the Hulk and also, you know, foreshadow the whole thing as related to Tony Stark because they could have said that Thanos had been spying on them for years, but because they didn't execute the scene properly, everything came across as disjointed and uneven and several of the scenes with the Guardians just needed, again, a complete rewrite as I see it. And the whole Thor thing with the eye, that should have happened. He should have gotten his eye back when he got his hammer back, as he should have been healed from that injury when he got the new hammer, not Rocket Raccoon conveniently having an eye in his pocket. That that really, again, would have had a bit more organic fashion and a bit more organic transition. And many of the scenes, again, with these whole Black Order, they should have been, they shouldn't have really been there. What should have happened was... They, they, they were just a plot device they, because they weren't characters. They, weren't, they didn't have personalities. They didn't have voices. They were just there to move the story forward, but they weren't there to be characters. And a lot of elements in the story, again, they, if they had rewritten it, they could have had a classic on their hands. But because they rushed and were sloppy, we really got a really mediocre movie, which was, again, like a Star Trek The Next Generation Part 1 season finale instead of being the movie that everyone was set up to believe was to be the big payoff. And that's what's really sad about Avengers Infinity War, is that, yes, it made a lot of money, but when you watch this movie critically and you start taking a look at it, you start to see that this movie really could have been a lot better, and had they taken a little bit more time to craft a better screenplay, they could have made a classic that was on the level of 2008's Iron Man. If you want to try some of my African-American fantasy like The Temptation of John Haynes and The Man Who Rules the World, you may do so by clicking the link to Amazon.com in the description box. And if you want to help me make more videos like this, you can donate to my Patreon by clicking the link in the description box. That's all I have to say for this video. You can comment, rate, and subscribe.